Okay, well, good morning to everybody. What an honor to be with you. Pastor John, Pastor Karen, thank you so much. Pastor Michael, we appreciate you guys. You know, you've been involved with us well over 20 years. The last time I was here, you didn't have this building and you moved in in 2001. That means I ain't been around in a while. And I apologize for that. You guys have been so faithful to support our ministry. And uh, every month we have a check comes in. So as you give into this church, uh, it's funneled not only to us, but other works around the world. And uh, we're very thankful for that. So this is going to be a good morning. We're going to have a time where you get to see the faces and find out what's going on, what your giving's doing, and just find out that Jesus is rocking things on the other side of the world too. Amen? You guys ain't got it all here, okay? He's big enough to do it everywhere. Amen? Amen. Uh, I so enjoy hanging around your pastor. I, he just drips with this stuff, you know. He just, you know, he just, last time I was here, I still, you know, he talked to me about intercession, and, and I still remember that, the three points, you know, you got to tear it down, then you build it up, then you maintain it, you know. And last night he was dumping out of this other stuff. I said, good Lord, I got to go mull all of this over now. And so what a blessing uh, your leaders are here and uh, praise God. We're going to have a good time this morning. Uh, we're, do we have that video queued up? We're going to show that, and then Kathy's going to come up and greet you. Then I'm just going to go over a few things, and we'll get right into the word here. So, oh. Okay, praise God. Uh, I, a lot of times I, I say that I am kind of the voice of the ministry. I'm the guy out in the front, always, you know, gift to gab and talking and everything. But uh, Kathy's the real heart of the ministry, so we'd like to invite her up and just share a few moments with you. Come on up. She getting the glasses out and the Bible's coming up. I might have to sit down for a little while here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, I try not to, to take too much of his time because I know he has so much to say. And I, I really en I enjoy hearing him speak and share, you know, about the work and everything. But I, I also know in my heart that, you know, he's not complete by himself. And sometimes the people need to hear from Mama. They need to hear from the other side. So um, I probably some of you might wonder, you know, what do I do there all this time and everything? Well, I spend a lot of my time with God because um, I can do nothing without Him. One of my favorite scriptures is in Daniel 11:32, the last part there, and. When I teach on the names of God in our Bible school, I, I love to use the scripture. It's one of my key scriptures. Those that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And so if you want to hang out with anybody, that's who you want to hang out with. You just hang out with him because he's going to rub off on you. Amen. So that's the one you want to hang out with. So I spend, if, if, I, if I don't get it quite right, my kids will say, and I haven't had my prayer time, they'll say, Mama, go pray. Because they know that God is what I need, you know. Some years ago, I, I had a little up in our house, uh, one of the house God put us into there. I went into my room there. It had a, uh, they have a worship, the, the uh, Buddhists have a worship room in their house usually. And uh, so in that little tiny little closet in my house, I took out all the idols and I took out all the, st all the stuff they had in there. And that tiny little room in there is where I found and made it my prayer room. So God taught me. He taught me a lot in that little room. And I learned how to minister to the Father. And I learned how. He told me. He said, Kathy, there's no distance in the spiritual realm. The same, same thing that you do in the prayer line, you can do right there. So I learned how to speak in the situations right there. Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us whenever he was going through some things. You know, when he went up there and the devil brought him into temptations and things like that. Every, one, the first thing I noticed in that he taught us. He taught us to speak, speak the word only in that. 
Every time the enemy came with him with a temptation, he would turn right around and face him and speak the word of God in his face. And the enemy always turned, and he always walked away. He came back, but Jesus had the right answer. He knew this word of God. So find out the key scriptures that you need in areas that the enemy hounds you on. Like the spirit of fear. Fear is one of the, one of the main things the enemy uses with people. If he can get you afraid and he can divide up your family and divide up your house, he can get a, a stronghold. He can get in there. So you see, he was, he was the head of the praise and worship in heaven. Remember what, he said, what his job was? He, he knows the power of praise and worship. That's one of the greatest tools that we can have is in praise and worship. Many times when I'm disturbed and I, I'm not settled in my spirit, I walk around the yard or I walk around and I just worship the Lord right out of my gut. Right out of my gut, I just worship the Lord and let the Holy Spirit minister. You know what? That thing leaves. It leaves. It leaves. Not just for me, but you've got, it, it, you've got you, you, you can touch and you can reach anywhere. From, from this area, your office right here, from the spiritual realm. Yes, yes. But Jesus spoke the word right there. And so one of the biggest things that I had to deal with in my life, my, my childhood was not the best in the world. And I had fear. I, the enemy used fear on me because my mother and daddy were, one was a believer and one was not. And I had the honor of bringing my dad to the Lord before he died. But during my childhood, I had a lot of, he needed deliverance. He needed help. And I was a child, but God made me have a relationship with him, so I was able to bring the daddy to the Lord when it was time. But I had a spirit of fear in me, and I was so strong. And, and I didn't know what to do. And, and, but God taught me what to do. Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. I learned to do what I saw my Jesus do. And I learned to speak the word to the circumstances. And I would use this scripture right here. I can remember sitting inside my bed one night. There was a hell star coming all around me. And, and I lived in a house that had a tin roof on it. And it was just pounding on. I'd sit in there and help my baby. And I just cried like a little child because I was a child. And I just cried. I didn't. My neighbors was gone. And, and I didn't know what to do. So I didn't, and every time he, the enemy would come at me with fear and knock me back, and not because of fear, you know. And so the, one night I was in a prayer meeting, and these people began to, to help me. They, began, they stopped the prayer meeting and began to help me with some things. I went in there sick, and they taught me how to use the Word of God in situations like that, to speak the Word to things, circumstances. So when you're dealing with fear, go to this scripture right here. Get it inside your spirit. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. That spirit of fear did not come from our God. He didn't give it to you. But the power, but he gave us the power, the spirit of power. He gave us the spirit of love, and he gave us a sound mind. And that's another area. Sometimes the enemy will try to make you think there's something wrong with you. Things are going wrong. He'll try to tell you you're crazy. You know, you're this, you're that. You know what? He's crazy. And so you need to tell him what the Word says about you. Learn to read the Word to the enemy. Praise, worship one to another. And speak the Word only, you know, to him. And you know what? He's going to run from you because he don't know who you are when you're speaking the Word of God. You are, you are part. Jesus is the head. And we are the body of Christ. God gave us authority and dominion. And when we begin to walk in that... And living that out of here, it's powerful. It's power. And the enemy can't get past it. Praise and worship. If you just use the praise and worship and the word of God, you will, you will, you will walk past that thing. But every time I would sense fear, I, the enemy would try to come back with fear again and again and again. And every time he did, every time I sensed it coming on me, I mean, the devil will put thoughts in your mind. Try to make you get fearful. Your thoughts and things like, all kinds of little things like that. Well, I learned. I said, no, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. He's given me a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. I would speak that every time he came near me with that until it stopped. It stopped coming toward me. And today, when I'm riding in my car, whatever I'm doing, 
I just began to worship the Lord. I pray in the Spirit, I train myself. I pray in the Spirit, and I worship the Lord. I worship the Lord, and I speak the Word only. So you know what? That'll help you in your life. So I, if I'm going to do anything in, in with my time here, I just want to put, uh, put the Word into you and just let you know my faith. I can speak of my faith. I can speak of my Lord. He is my Lord, my Master, and my owner. And that's what keeps me alive. It's what causes me to stand. God bless you, and we love you. God bless you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. God is good, and his word endureth forever. Amen? Praise God. Just a few things about the ministry, then we'll get into the word. Uh, the sermon I've got for you this morning is, Let Jesus Rock Your World. Okay, so we're going to get into that shortly. Just a few things about the ministry before. You saw the short promo video. Uh, we have been so blessed. I don't know why God blessed us so much, but he, we, this is our 31st year in the nation of Thailand. Uh, we went there with a vision to train up national Christian leaders to preach the gospel and the power of the Spirit. We've done that through our Bible school. Uh, we've graduated hundreds, and I guess, and I don't keep a lot of numbers and stuff, but I, I guess an awful lot of people. And uh, we have, from that, has evolved a church planting evangelism team. We just dedicated our 161st church that we planted and built over there. And uh, we're kicking it up a little bit. And uh, we've got eight churches under construction right now. I've never had that many projects going at one time. We've been averaging about eight to ten churches a year. We're trying to bring that up to 20 churches a year. And uh, so just things are popping, things are happening, and it's pretty exciting. People are coming to Christ. And in those 161 churches on any given weekend, you'll have over 30,000 people assemble worshiping God. And those are people that have come to Christ because of those outreaches. So we're excited about that. One of the reasons we're able to... Uh, kind of kick that up a little bit right now we have an organization that joined hands with us and I only have to we only have to raise five thousand dollars per location this uh, this organization has multiple matching funds and they help us In fact they just did a fundraiser and their keynote speaker was President George Bush President Bo George Bush come and talk to them about church planning and his experience of coming to Christ and uh, so amazing group of people, been a great blessing to us, and uh, they want to build just hundreds and hundreds of churches. They've built seven, almost 7,000 churches around the world right now, and God linked them with us. And, and the first time I talked to the guy, I, I told him, well, we built 100 churches at that time. He said, well, that's good, Charlie. He says, how many are you building at a time? I said, well, maybe two, sometimes three. He says, you think you can kick that up to 20 at a time? And I'm on the phone. I said, who is this guy? I've never even heard anybody even dream of something like that, let alone to challenge me. Well, we got it up to eight, so praise God, we're on our way. <laughs> Another thing we do is child sponsorship. Uh, 28 years ago, this month, next month, August, where are we at? In July, uh, just next week, 28 years ago, we found a set of twins on top of a mountain. They're supposed to be murdered because they were twins. A tribal group has a crazy superstition, and they murdered those babies at birth. Long story short, they got delivered out of that situation, were given over to a drug warlord's operation to raise up, be, be soldiers in the heroin army. And then we ended up buying them for $4 each and brought them down the mountain to find a good home for them. Well, 28 years later, I ain't got them out of the house yet. Uh, they are Jason and Jeremy, our sons, and uh, they both work with us within the ministry with their wives. Uh, praise God. <laughs> I never dreamed of getting into the kid business, I tell you. And uh, now I got, uh, well, started with two, and I got 700 of them now. And uh, so we care for a lot of children, and those kids, uh, some of the kids are on the table in the back. If you're interested in child sponsorship, uh, you can see us, Kathy and I be out there. And you know what? We have people that signed up for child sponsorship back in the 1990s are still faithful in this church. I don't know who you are or which you are, but I was like amazed. I mean, I golly. So, uh, so praise God. These are kids. Uh, we, have a, we adopted a new home. I don't have time to get into the story and everything, but got a lot of high schoolers in there that would have been uh, dropped out of school had we not come in and intervened. So I got 20 four of the high schoolers and then some younger kids back there it's a great program if you're interested choose a child take the packet home with you just make sure we get this information 
uh, and then put the child's uh, name and code on there. Two levels of sponsorship, premium is $40 a month, standard is 30. The difference in those, the premium automatically includes a birthday gift, a Christmas gift, spook, uh, school book uniform costs, tuition costs, all wrapped into that one monthly deal. Uh, it's a great program. Uh, we have a tremendous communication system between the child and you. You get letters from them, you get special projects from them, stuff like that. So we'll be there at the table after service. We'd love to speak to you about that. We also brought a bunch of coffee several years ago. Uh, we basically, you know, I'll just tell you how it is. We just took in 70 new kids this year. Some of them are four. I'll be in my 80s when they get out of college. And, uh, you know, when you take care of kids, you've got to think long term. And uh, so we have developed a coffee business uh, looking to the long term of support for the ministry. And that's great coffee. This was just roasted up. We import it here to the U.S. We're based down in Tucson. This was just roasted this week in Tucson, packaged up, brought to you. I've got some Mexicali or Mayali or however you, uh, you Mexicans say it. Uh, I can't say it quite as good. But this is our sellout favorite. It's chocolate, vanilla, and a touch of cinnamon. And uh, so that's back there. This is what I drink every day, special blend, and uh, that's just uh, great beans and everything. But uh, the proceeds help with the kids and all that. It's $10 a bag what we sell it, but today I'm going to do a sale like I never have done before. Usually I joke with them. I say, okay, $10 a bag or two for 20 But uh, I'm actually going to give you a real sale today because I got quite a bit of coffee, so 10 bucks a bag or three for 30 No, no, no. <laughs> Now I'll give you three bags for 20 okay? And uh, that's below our wholesale price. So uh, come back, get some coffee at the end of the service, and uh, praise God. I mean, if you don't drink coffee, it's good fertilizer for your roses, man. They need this acid, or give it to your uh, neighbor or somebody, and you can bless the kids with it. Amen? Praise God. Well, that's the, uh, the spiel part of it, and that's all necessary. We have to let you know what's going on. And in my sermon, you're going to hear some of the stories and some of the testimonies of what God's been doing there. It's just been an awesome ride. Kathy and I went there. You know, we have always been the least likely to succeed, the bottom of the barrel. I mean, you know, there's no hope, you know, group and all of that. But somehow God has taken that. You know, he does like to take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen. We got a lot of people in the back just scratching their heads going, I don't know how that happened, boy. They <laughs> but anyhow, we went to Thailand 31 years ago. We didn't have no support. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a vehicle for like three years. Walked everywhere. We had a grand total of like 200 dollars a month coming in a family of five and you can't live anywhere on the world on 200 bucks a month i'm telling you but god the rest is history now i've got a staff of 70 at our main operation i support 70 church planter evangelists and we got 26 staff in a refugee camp so that's 166 people that we pay the salaries for every month and are touching tens of thousands of people across that nation Glory to God. Some of the new outreach, the church planting, uh, we've just agreed to plant 20 churches in, three, uh, or in a section of the country that has the least amount of Christians. Less than one-tenth of a percent of the population is Christian. And yet we've, uh, we've got some things popping there. People are coming to Christ, and we're targeting for 20 churches there. So it's just exciting. I mean, this is like a ride. You just hang on and say, man, I don't know why it's happening, how it's happening, but it's Jesus, and it is happening. Amen? Praise God. Let Jesus rock your world. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today. And, Father, we're not here to listen to a man. We want to hear from heaven. As pastors already said today, we want to hear a word from heaven. So, Father, we open our hearts unto you. Holy Spirit, we invite you in uh, just to minister to us, to open our hearts and, and draw out of me, Lord God, that I would speak words that would bless and encourage and edify this congregation, a word in due season, Father. And, and I just thank you. We yield this time to you and thank you and praise you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to start over in Matthew 16, and I'll just start giving you a little background here. In Matthew 16 and verse 1, it says, The Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus kind of gives, you know, he talks to the Pharisees and all of that. And I, I, what I want you to get a picture here is Jesus got his disciples, you know. 
I love these disciples. They give me a lot of hope. When I see these guys, I, I say, there's hope for me, okay? So Jesus kind of, you know, blows out the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, you know, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two different sects of the Jewish people. One believed in the resurrection, one did not believe in the resurrection. The ones that didn't were the Sadducees, but now you know why they were sad, you see. Amen? Because there's no hope, there's no resurrection. So, uh, anyhow, uh, good word. <laughs> see, I, I like to keep it simple. You know, it makes it, okay, which one's which? Oh, yeah, okay, that just makes it simple for me. Anyhow, when they're all done, Jesus He's talking to his disciples after, you know, they're sitting there watching this conversation with the Sadducees and Pharisees. And then he looks at his disciples and he says, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Which obviously we understand he meant the doctrine. He says, These guys, you got to be careful, man, the stuff they're teaching. Well, the disciples. They got all worried, and you read here in verse 7, it says, They reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we've taken no bread? They're, re they're realizing the last time they forgot, you know, and they're probably, Andrew, did you bring the bread this time? Did you blow it again? I mean, we're gonna, he's going to get mad if he's got to do the miracles again and, you know, feed a whole bunch of people. Who brought the bread? Who is supposed to do that? And there's no women on the team, so it's a bunch of guys. You can imagine, you know. Uh, they got a little beef jerky or something, maybe, but they forgot the bread, okay? <laughs> We're going to have fun today. You guys are wild. You're, you're pulling something out of me here. I don't know what this is. <laughs> okay. So Jesus, being aware of it, says to them, and look what he, in verses 8 and 9 here, he says, Oh, ye of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you've brought no bread? Do you not remember and understand the five loaves and the five thousands and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves and the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I speak to you concerning, I'm not speaking to you about bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Now isn't it amazing, in those few words, Jesus, he, he, he ministered to them about worry, he ministered to them about provision, and he gave them revelation. He drips with just information, revelation coming out, okay? We see the disciples are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. That's why I like these guys. They make me feel good. I feel like I'm in good company because if Jesus put up with them, you know, he can put up with me, amen? So, uh, and finally down, what, in verse uh, 12, they got it. They say, oh, okay, okay, we, we, we got this now. He's not talking about bread, so, uh, and he moves on. Now, that's just the background of where we got, or where we're building up to. What I want you to see is over in verse 13, where it says, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And that's a good question. We need to ask that question. When, you know, who is this Jesus? He, he confronted this group and he says, who are people saying that I am? And, you know, they gave some answers. They say, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're the Elijah the prophet. They all knew he was somebody special. But nobody could quite dial him in and figure out, who is this guy? He's very different. He's not, he doesn't conform to religion like we've known religion. And yet he's obviously something's happening. The guy walks around with miracles and the sick being healed and the dead being raised, multitudes being fed. And so the people knew there was something special about him. And with us, it's a good question for us. Who do we say that Jesus is? Do we have, you know, that sickly, that weak, frail, little skinny guy that looks like, you know, you could blow him over if a wind came through, you know, it'd just blow away? I, I hate that image that they've made of Jesus. Sad and always just forlorn and, and like that. Or for us, is he that water walking, devil casting out, raising the dead, healing, the sun of the morning, the bright morning star, the prince of peace? You know, who is Jesus to you? Because who he is to you determines a lot of what your life is going to be like. See, our faith comes back to a 
a default system. If we talk computer language, everything, you know, goes back to default. Don't hit default on your iPhone because it does away with everything you, you programmed in there, just goes back to the default settings. Somebody said that was my word. I didn't know what happened last night, but my phone ain't working anymore. <laughs> but computers, everything has a default setting. You and I have a default setting for our faith. Uh, some of us are of little faith because we have, have that default setting in us. Well, Kathy mentioned, get the word on the inside because it's what's in your belly. When, when the crap hits the fan, excuse me, I know I'm not politically correct and this is America and I ain't supposed to be like this, but this is just me. That's why I haven't been here probably for 18 years. They wouldn't invite me back, but... Uh, I made such a mess the last time I was here. <laughs> but you know what I mean? When life happens and you're up against the wall, what is it that comes out of your belly? Is it fear and unbelief? Is it doubt and confusion? Or does something come up out of you that just makes you stand against that storm and know that you're going to the other side? See, that's your default setting. You can adjust that default setting up down whichever way you want depending on how much time you invest in this word and how effective you are at building it inside of you amen people ask me charlie why do so many miracles happen on the mission field well they don't have obamacare they ain't got insurance we're building a church at a and thank god for health care and insurance we really need this stuff but they don't have that kind of stuff we're building a church at a village right now, Kota uh, uh, Village, and I sent my, my church planner back there, my, the head of that department, to check it out. He got back there last week. He says, Charlie, we can't get to that village until November. He said, the river's raging. And I thought, wow, what if something happens in that village? Well, those people, that's just how they live. And when somebody gets sick, if God don't move, then we just dig a hole. So that will adjust their default settings up real quick. And they can believe, they actually believe. See, sometimes our fault is we have so many safety nets. We got Walgreens and CVS on every corner. We got, you know, all the clinics and cares, and we got insurance. And we got all them safety nets, so we, we politely believe Jesus. But we know if it ain't happening, I've got this uh, in order over here. So I apologize. You're Americans. You can't help it. This is just the way you've been programmed. Except for if you go to Believer's Church, you might have been programmed a little bit different. Do we got any believers in Believer's Church? Okay, glory to God. <laughs> okay, verse 15. Jesus takes a little bit further. He looks to his disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? See, that's what we were just drilling right there. Who is Jesus to you? I imagine after the leaven mess up, that most of them are sitting there, I ain't saying nothing, man. We screwed it up on that last one, and we, he didn't even hear us, but he knew what we were saying. So now everybody's just sitting quiet, except for Peter. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. Peter got it right, boy. Every once in a while, now, you know, don't get too excited. Five, five verses later, Jesus is, you know, calling him Satan. Get behind me, Satan, okay? Peter's Peter, man. <laughs> He's either hot or cold. You know, Jesus said, I'd rather be hot or cold. That lukewarm stuff, I just spew you out of my mouth, man. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> and that's cool, because Jesus likes us cold, too. He likes us every spectrum, doesn't he? Hallelujah. That's good. Now, he'd rather have you hot. But the lukewarm thing, see, you're, de you're self-deceived. You'd rather have you cold where you realize, man, I am out of it and I need God, because then you can gravitate and move towards God. Okay? Praise God. But he says, who do you say that I am? Hallelujah. In the verses after that, you're, you're very familiar. This is a very uh, familiar portion of Scripture here. Uh, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, that's what we're wanting here today. We want to hear from our Father who is in heaven. We want to hear the, the words that the Spirit of God would breathe into our life. Amen. 
and I learned years ago to go into a meeting not worrying about who the speaker is. Or go in there with your heart open to God, and God will speak to you through anybody. Amen? Glory to God. He says, I also say, verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus basically just reveals a new world order that's coming into place. He's saying, you know, he's so excited. Because if you read the end of that chapter, he, after this, he says, in fact, in verse 20, he commanded his disciples that they don't tell anyone he was Jesus the Christ. See, up when he questioned me, he says, who do they say I, the Son of Man, am? Now he says, don't tell them I'm Jesus the Christ, the anointed one that came from heaven. He says, keep the lid on this thing right now. That didn't work too well, but uh, anyhow. But see, Jesus knows in a matter of days, in a very short time, he will be hanging on that cross. It was a miserable thing. It was a shameful thing. And yet he endured the suffering of the cross, the Bible tells us, because he looked ahead to the joy that was set before him. He looked to you and I. He looked to this planet being covered with Christians and churches and vibrant things going on. Because of that, he allowed them to strip him naked and beat him and pull his beard out and and humiliate him. Could you imagine hanging on a cross in front of your mother, stripped naked? What a disgusting, humiliating death. But he knew the joy that was set before him. He knew the church would be birthed in this earth. And this is what he ushers in right here is a new world order where he says the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So many times we've got this idea that uh, uh, hell is attacking us, but we're going to be able to keep the gate shut against hell. That's not really what it is. The gates of hell, we're the ones attacking hell, and the gates can't hold you out. I'm in Thailand. I ain't hiding from the devils. I'm making headaches for the devils. Amen? We're busting hell wide open over there. We're getting witch doctors saved. We're moving into villages and, and just blasting, hell, blasting the hell out of them and bringing the glory in. Amen? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about us believers, the church. I give the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The things that you bind will be bound. The things that you loose will be loosed. Man has now been given that authority to walk as Christ ambassadors in this earth with the power and the anointing and the authority of heaven behind them. I remember the very first village we went up to, and we went up, We got our first truck. It wasn't even mine yet. Missionary was leaving the country, and he, he had it, and we'd been walking for three years, taking buses, and if we could afford it, paying to take the little taxi thing. Now I think I've got 30 or 40 vehicles. I, don't, I can't even keep count of them anymore. But praise God, back in them days, uh, we, 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 we just walked. And uh, stuff like that. But I remember that first truck, we went up to this village and we had to, took some Bible school students and we we're going to do an evangelistic outreach. We're out in the middle of nowhere. We found out later that the country didn't even know this village existed. We got out there, we we're having dinner to get ready for the evening service and they come over, they said, hey, there's a boy back here, he's drank some insecticide, he's tried to kill himself, look like he's dead right now, you got to rush him to the hospital. I thought, my Lord, we went back to this little hut. Now, you got a picture. We are three hours from the nearest paved road. We've been on bumps and, you know, hills and holes and everything. And we go back there, and the entire village surrounds this hut. And we're inside. This kid's just wide-eyed, eyes rolled back in the bottom of his head. I looked at him, and I looked up to the village. I said, you know what? We're not taking him to the hospital. We've come here to share Jesus Christ with you. You people don't know that, but we're going to pray for him in the name of Jesus. God's going to raise him up. If he doesn't, then you can chase us out of the village knowing we're a bunch of liars. I said, I, I'm, I'm thinking, what did I just do? Are you crazy? You know, I, you split into two people, you know. 
I mean, that didn't come from my head. That come out, my Bible school students, you know, them Asians are supposed to have little slanted eyes. They had big bulging eyes. They were, they were bug-eyed, like, whoa, what did the pastor just say? I looked at them, I said, pray. Boy, they began to pray. I don't care if they didn't believe in praying in tongues. They prayed in tongues that day, boy. <laughs> well, about 45 minutes later, that kid came too. God raised him up. And uh, we prayed for him, and he got saved. Very first person from that village got saved. Amen. We ended up, we had revival that night. We had a little service going that night, boy, I tell you. We ended up, by, we, we, uh, our pastor, we, the, vil, the village, did, well, this is how crazy the devil is. We planted a church in that village, and our pastor, we needed a home for him. Well, the, the, the witch doctor's house came up for sale because they said the spirits told him he had too fancy of a house that he had to go live in a shack out on the edge of the village. So we put our pastor in the nicest house in the village, and we put the witch doctor out in the bushes. I think even he came to Christ now. So He probably sat there so many nights looking back at his house saying, I don't know what happened. That Jesus guy's over there, and my, my devils ain't treating me too good. Hallelujah. I found this quote. I was looking for another quote, but I found this quote by Oswald Chambers. All of God's people are ordinary people who've been made extraordinary by the purpose that he's given to them. Amen. We're all just normal folk. But we can become extraordinary when you tap into that purpose that God has had with you. <laughs> we have a young man. Well, a young man. He's in his 50s. You know, that's still young to me. But uh, he came, to, him and his wife came to our Bible school and long story short, which I'm really not good at, so thank God that uh, Pastor John said I can preach all the way to evening service and they're catering lunch in today, amen? So uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, Weir Chai came to our, our school, and I had no clue. You don't know. You, you receive students. You don't know who these guys are. And uh, one day I was going to do a seminar, and he asked if he could ride with me. I said, sure, jump in. So we pull out, and in the first five miles, he said, uh, John, Char uh, John means like reverend or pastor. He says, uh, John, Charlie, he says, I don't know if you know my, my testimony. I said, no, brother, I don't even know your name yet, you know. And uh, he said, well, I'm Weirichai. He says, before I came to this school, he says, I was a crazy man. I lived in the jungle naked for several years. I thought, good Lord, we got a three-hour drive. This is, uh, I, I moved over a little bit, you know. Or no, I moved this way over there because we drive on that side, okay. <laughs> But uh, then he began to share his story with me. Well, uh, this guy in the first, and he was a little off because he had lost his mind. There's a long story behind it and everything. But God brought him back. Hallelujah. And uh, God spoke to him. And he became like that, what, that King Nebuchadnezzar, the guy who lost his rational thought and became like an animal. That's what happened to him. But in that state, he heard the voice of God. And God spoke to him and says, men might reject you, no one might love you, but my love for you is always there. And he, he loved him back. And uh, then they brought him to our Bible school. First year he did a 40-day fast. Uh, and w totally, we didn't encourage it or anything. Second year he did a, did I say first year? First year he did a 40-day fast. Second year he did another 40-day fast. I tell you, after the first one, he was, he was recovered. He, he was still off a bit, but he was 90% back. After the second 40-day fast, this guy come out with a miracle ministry. And uh, he would take students out on the weekend, and I couldn't wait till Monday morning to hear the testimonies. I mean, they would get cripples that had not walked in years. Just take them, said, in the name of Jesus, you know, I don't have silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And they would rise and walk. He's the only guy I ever hired on graduation day. He, with his, him and his wife, graduated with their uh, graduation gowns and all of that. And I hired him on the spot, not just to join our team, but to be the head of my evangelism team. Anybody who's got that kind of stuff going, I want him influencing my evangelist. And I jokingly, I, I'm a clown. I like to joke around. I said, where's I? I said, I need you to be head of my evangelism. Team. Oh, okay, okay. I said, listen, I want you to go build me 50 churches. He says, okay. And he turns around and walks away. And I, I, call, I tried to call him because to let him know I was joking. But I think he's built 60, so I figured I'm just not going to call him back anymore, you know. 
why, why interfere, you know? <laughs> but the guy is phenomenal. And to show you how, how he thinks, I was with him. We were doing dedications, and many times we do dedications several days in a row. We were on our sixth dedication. Weird child had been with me all of that time. We're at the si- you get you get burned out on church dedication. I'm sixth one. You're you know I, I hate to say it, but I mean they're all excited. But you this is your sixth dedication, you know. Well, we're sitting there waiting for the service, and I say weird child because it was one of his villages. I say what's been happening here? Tell me about this village. He said oh, he said well. He said, this is a village that opposed us a lot, but uh, he said, this lady over here had cancer, so I prayed for her, and she was the doctors that give her up to die, but I prayed for her, and God healed her. I said, oh, and he said, and that guy over there, he had this great big old goiter hanging off his neck. He said, I prayed for that, and that fell off. Then he had another testimony, and I'm thinking, you've been with me for six days, and you haven't even mentioned this stuff until I asked you about it. Definitely not American. If you're an American and you get a headache healed, you put it on the website, you put out a Twitter blast, you put it out on Facebook, I mean, you got the newsletters going out and saying, you know, put your 50 bucks in if you want this same miracle happening for you. And this guy, he just thinks this is what we're supposed to do as Christians. Because he, well, this is what Jesus did. Oh, okay, this is how we're supposed to act. Oh, okay. And he just goes and does it. Hallelujah. Who do you say that I am? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Another lady wears up this village, and I had ripped out the muscles in my shoulder, had ruined myself. We were in a, a remote area, and I had to pick a truck off of the road and put it, or it fell off the road, and I had to pick it up and put it. And it was on a steep mountain, and I was the only guy that was big enough. There was a tree growing out, and I could put one foot on the tree, one on the side, and lift this truck out. Well, we got the truck out, but it destroyed my shoulder. And it was for months. I could hardly lift my arm. We're on our way up to this one village, Mamalor Village, where we built our very first church. And, uh, we, and my team said, because I'm hurting, my team says, well, there's a lady up here, and she can massage it, and she knows how to get the, you know, nerves and all that fixed up and everything. So I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I need a massage right now, you know. So I go up there, and I get, they take me to this little shack, and this little woman, Dang's mother, and, uh, and she's a tribal woman. She's in her 70s at that time. I don't know if you know what betel nut is. In India and Asia, they chew it, and it makes their mouth black. When they smile, all you see is a black hole. It's really gross. Uh, Kind of like the Baptists smoking their cigarettes, you know. Over there, they, they do the betel nut bit, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it's a dirty habit, but it's just a part of culture of there, you know. Well, she come out, and they told her she spoke a tribal language. I had my interpreter there. So she said, well, sit down. So I sit down, and, and uh, she starts working on it. And she says, Charlie, uh, through the interpreter, she says, Charlie, you, you brought the gospel to our village. And I kind of like, yeah. Yeah, we, we planted the church here, and I remember when we built the church and everything. And she keeps working, and she got quiet, and then she says, You know, you taught us about healing. I said, Uh-oh. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm saying, Okay, I see where this is going here, you know. <laughs> my, my pride was being deflated real quick, you know, like a puffer fish, you know, all of a sudden. You know? <laughs> and uh, she says, You know, you taught us that when you had a sickness or a disease or an injury, that you trusted Jesus and you didn't really worry about the circumstances of the pain. You just stood on the Word of God. And, and I, I'm just sinking. I'm, I'm just feeling. Because I'm, I'm the preacher. I'm the guy who planted the church in the village. I'm the great white hero that came and saved these poor people, right? Well, boy, she preached to me that day. And what, what blessed me is I realized here's a woman in her 70s. She cannot read or write. She's never went to school a single day of her life. She's never lived in civilization. She's never been off of this mountaintop. She's on the back of the, one of the highest mountains in Thailand. But the gospel, in its simplicity, changed her life. And she became preacher that day to the preacher. And I said, Jesus, that is beautiful. Because this is not complicated. And the simplest mind, the uneducated mind, can apply the principles of the Word of God and walk a victorious life. She passed a few years ago, 
an Old Testament saint's death. She didn't die in sickness and disease. She just went on to be with Jesus. What a blessing. Jesus introduced this new world order that we could enjoy life and change lives. Amen. Now, here it gets a little complicated. Uh, this is not the, we were, the first two things was Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Secondly, he says, who do you say I am? And I'm taking a little bit further and say, who do men say that you are? Because, see, many times we're bound by image. And that's proved out with Jesus. When he was in Nazareth, the Bible says that he could do no mighty miracles there other than heal a few minorly sick people. Why? Because they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? The image that people cast upon you can affect you. And we have to understand that and be able to come free from that. You've probably heard the story of Thomas Edison. He wasn't too good in school. Thomas Edison, I don't know if the lights we have today is because he invented, you know, he, he discovered the light bulb. And I think over a thousand inventions Thomas Edison created. There's a story out that says uh, when he was in school, the principal called his, him, and his, him and his mother in and gave him a note, and they took Thomas Edison out of school. He got home, and, his mo- and he asked his mother what the note say. And his mother said that, well, he said that you are such a genius that the school doesn't have teachers appropriate enough to teach you, so he wants me to teach you at home. And uh, now I did diagnose this because I like to find out things. This isn't quite true, but it makes a great story, and a lot of motivational pe- tre- preachers use that. And this, that story goes on to say, as, after his mother passed, he was going through some things, and he found that note from the school. And the note said, your son is uh, with such learning disabilities that he can't, you know, we ha- can't have him in our classes, so you need to remove him and teach him yourself. That part's true. But the part that wasn't quite true, well then, you know, so that sounded really good. I could have just told you that. But because I got the revelator over here on the front row, I got to make sure everything lines up with truth, okay? So, uh, <laughs> no, because I want to be based in truth, too. I'm just kidding. I'm a revelator, too, you know. But I, I did research it through Snopes and all that, and it said it, the truth is that they got that note from the school. And it infuriated Thomas Edison, and his mother did have to homeschool him after that. But it made him so mad, and he was dyslexic, and he had a lot of challenges. But it infuriated him so much that he went on to be the man that we know, one of the greatest inventors of our age. What an amazing thing. But see, the world was trying to cast something upon him. You have to be careful of that. When I was... uh, in high school, they did these placement tests of what you would do well at in school. And it was based on zero to, a, or in occupation, excuse me. It was based on a zero to 100 scale, and by your academic abilities, it told you the percentage of what you'd do well at. Well, I got two negative scores. And our supervisor, he looked at it, he said, this is odd because it's supposed to be zero to 100, but Charlie, uh, you got two negatives. You got a negative six as a farmer, and a negative nine as a minister, clergyman. Well, what I do today, I've got over 500 acres of coffee planted, and I preach the gospel. So go figure. The, th- the two occupations that they figure I'm absolutely useless for are the two things. God must just chuckle. He must say, <laughs> you know, the Bible says in Psalms 2, he sits in the heavens and laughs. You know, he just sits back there. you got to be kidding. I guess, I, I wonder if he decided then, he said, well, I'm just going to make him a farmer and a preacher, you know. Now, we know better than that because, as uh, Pastor said, from before in Ephesians 2.10, that we are his workmanship. He created us unto good works, which he before ordained that we should walk in those and do those. Amen? So I realize that, uh, you know, anyhow. So you have to be careful. And then when uh, Kathy and I, we, went, we met in Bible school, and we were kind of viewed as the least likely couple to succeed in Bible school. Then we went to a church, and we, were, we joined a group of other couples that were training for ministry, and we, there were five different couples, and we were kind of looked down upon as the couple that really didn't have much hope. Uh, so apparently our school must have just kept sending that message forward everywhere I was going, 
Then we get to Thailand, and the missionaries, we found out years later, took bets. Missionaries aren't supposed to do this. They took bets of how many months we would make it before we'd fall flat on our face. Now they're all gone, and we got the biggest ministry in the nation. So, and that's a glory to God. <laughs> you know, the Bible says God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen. But see, if you allow that image to be cast on you, because as a child, I was very awkward. When I got called to the preach, I couldn't speak because I had many years of drug abuse behind me, and, and I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't talk to people. No, no way would I ever stand in front of people. So every, the world can cast this on you. And I, I just shared this a couple of weeks ago at a missions conference. It's like the world saying, no, no, no. And they were right. There was no ability. There was no natural gifting, nothing. But when I got saved, I found out Jesus said, go, go, go. And I kind of like to, you know Forrest Gump? Do you ever see the movie? Well, Forrest Gump really was, he was a mess, you know. He couldn't hardly walk or anything. And then bullies were, you know, making fun of him and chasing him. And I remember there with a pickup truck, and Forrest is trying to get home from school, and here comes that pickup truck, and that girl who liked Forrest, uh, she said, Forrest, run! And Forrest, you know, he looked, and Forrest starts running. Well, I feel that was my life. You know, the whole world, the school told me I couldn't do that stuff. The Bible school told me I couldn't do that stuff. The church told me I couldn't do that stuff. But Jesus says, run. So I, like Forrest, I started running. And I had contraptions holding me back and every obstacle in the world holding me back. But all of a sudden, we started running. And all of a sudden, God created the person that he called us to be. And now we got a whole trail of people going back. With How did that happen? What in the world happened there? That's our Jesus, amen? And we're not, he's no God, no respecter of persons, amen? I mean, if you just got the, you know, the gumption to get up and do something, he's going to get the wing, there'll be the wind under your wings, amen? Hallelujah. See, in Thailand, we've made an army of somebodies out of nobodies. And they're so loyal to us because we took all of them, were basket cases, and we made something out of them by putting the Word of God into their life, putting hope into their life, investing God's Word into them. One of our requirements to be on our staff, you have to come through our Bible school, two-year school. That's where they get grounded in the Word of God. That's where they get our DNA and our, our culture and, and everything. And it changes lives. When we adopted Jason and Jeremy, they come from the, the most despised tribe in the nation. The, the people, I won't even tell you all the details, but they're really looked down upon. And when they put him in our hands, they were dirt. They were dirt in the villagers' hands. When they put him into our hands, all of a sudden, there was value on those boys. They didn't know where they come from. They just knew who was holding them. As we held them, boys, all of a sudden, all the Thai people said, Whoa, those are beautiful babies. And I'm thinking, you're crazy because just a few days ago, they were filth, throwaway, castaways. But because they were held in our hands, they became beautiful to other people. Isn't that amazing? As we are held in the hands of Jesus, we become valuable. Amen? Perception is so important. How and, and you have to beware of, this is what we're talking about a little bit here, other people's perception of you. You don't let that bind you. You don't let that stop you. You have to realize your value in Christ. Years ago, a gentleman came to my office, and he walked in, and he was guarding something with his hand. He says, Brother Charlie, he says, I think you're going to America next week, right? I said, yeah. He says, listen, I've got this coin. He says, this thing's worth like a million dollars. And he told me the story behind it. He said, could you go sell it for me? And I didn't believe the story. I, I'm a little skeptical on that, you know, a million dollars. And, and he told me the story how a World War II soldier, a tribesman back in the jungles of Burma, was helping the Allied soldiers. And when this Allied soldier died, 
in the jungle, he handed this tribal man this coin and told him that this is very valuable, keep it. And he says that tribal man was the father of a local pastor we knew. And he said when his father died, he handed it to the pastor, told him the story, and, said, and told him the value of this coin. And, uh, and, and so now they want me to take it home and sell it. So he left the office, and literally I, I almost feel bad about it. But my briefcase was sitting over there, and I looked at it, kind of laughed, and I literally threw the coin over into my briefcase. Forgot about it. A week later, I land in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Pastor David picks me up, and we're at his house. And we're chatting, you know, just catching up. And all of a sudden, I remember this coin. I, and I said, I said, oh, David, you won't believe this story. And I told he said, really? He said, well, my son collects coins. He says, where's the coin at? I said, well, it's in my briefcase. He said, well, go get it. I'll go get my son's book. And he brings a book out, and we're paging through. All of a sudden, there it is. And it says, this is the most valuable coin ever in U.S. circulation. Only six of them known in the world. And the last one sold for $960,000. All of a sudden, I took that coin. I gently wrapped it back up because, you know, a good condition coin gets more money. You don't throw a good condition coin across the room into a briefcase. I went home with the hotel. I put that coin in my pocket. I wouldn't even take my hand out of my pocket. I walked around like this. I opened his door, and I looked out first to see if there's any burglars or bad guys out here, man. And I got to my hotel room that night, and I put a chair up against the door. Ain't nobody getting my million-dollar coin. Now, the coin didn't change, but my perception of it changed. Amen? <laughs> Many times we're like that valueless coin in our thinking or in others' thinkings about us. See, all the garbage I came through in life, I remember when I told my parents I got saved, they kind of laughed and said, what's next? You know, you've been, the, uh, you've been the vegetarian, you've been the hippie, you've been this, you've been, you know, you, every time you come through town, you're some new thing, you know. Uh, one year I'm a fruitarian. I actually lived on fruits for a whole year. Man, I was skinny. I was half of what I weigh right now. Floating, man, I tell you. But, uh, and then I met some Eritarians who just lived on air, and I figured, uh, we're going to draw the line here, you know, because there didn't seem to be too many of them around. So. But my parents seen it all. And so when I brought Jesus home, they just laughed and said, what's that? And my dad said, son, he says, you know, you're a drug dealer now, because the, by then they knew what I was doing. He says, you know, you, you've got motorcycles, you've got cars. He says, do you, do you realize if you become a priest, that's what he called it. He says, if you become a priest, you've got to do this vow of poverty, and you can't have any of this stuff. And I thought, you know, <laughs> my dad didn't know Jesus then. But like Kathy, I had the privilege of leading my mother and father to Christ. They're both in heaven now, glory to God. But see, we can be bound by that image, amen? Hallelujah. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, lastly, we're going to close with this. Most importantly, see, we looked at Jesus saying, who do men say that I am? Then he looked at his disciples say, who do you say that I am? Then I asked you, who do men say that you are? But I saved the best for last. Most importantly, who does he say? that you are. Amen? And uh, Pastor Karen shared that uh, Ephesians 2.10. She stole my scripture here this morning, but that's okay. I figure it was on the same, same wavelength here. But it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That verse changed my life. When I came out of the dark world that I came out of, motorcycles and drugs and all that crazy stuff, I, I had the lowest self-worth, I think, possible as a human being. And I couldn't believe that God could love me, but he did a miracle. I got saved through a supernatural encounter with Jesus. And I don't have time to get into all the testimonies and all that. I didn't, Christians would avoid me because I was a big, bad, ugly-looking dude. I know that's hard to believe. When you're looking at me today, that's hard to believe, I realize. But I was a bad dude. And uh, so I didn't get witness to, but I had a confrontation with Jesus, and I gave my life to him and got saved. Amen. And, uh, but I remember that scripture was a turning point. Because when I read it, it came alive to me. I said, God, this uh, I said, I have made nothing but a mess for over 20 years. This says you created me for good works. 
And I said, could this be possible? Is there any possibility that that's really truth right there? And I said, and I kind of challenged him. I said, if that's possible, because it says you planned before that I would do good works. I said, and I'm, I'm talking to God. I said, all I've done is bad things. I said, but if you can get anything good out of me, I'm yours. And that was a change of my thinking of the perception of me. Maybe like that coin, I began to say, maybe there is a possibility of some value there. And that revelation built on so many others in Psalms 139, it talks about how I'll praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Then it goes on to say, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written. The days were fashioned for me before they even existed. I was like, whoa, I said, this is destiny stuff here. I mean, if this is real, boy, this is good news. And I found out that it is good news. Amen. Uh, Your pastor was sharing with you some things. He's uh, hit his 65th birthday. He's an old man. I'm I'm just a couple years behind him, but I'm going to honor him as the old man. Praise the Lord. In full respect. (laughs) But we were talking about some things. When I hit 60, Pastor John, (laughs) I... Uh, I did some bargaining with God. I wasn't as intelligent as you were in your 65th year uh, revelation there. Because I was saying, God, I'm tired. I've worked hard. I'm kind of a workaholic. And what happened in Thailand, uh, there were probably, you know, in the early years, I neglected my family. I've done so. We've paid a price to do what we've done, okay? It hasn't been easy and we have, we've lost a daughter. We buried a daughter six years ago in Thailand. And there was probably times I was working too hard and uh, maybe didn't give my wife and my children the time they needed and all that. So when I hit 60, I'm like, okay, God, I said, you know, 700 kids, 10 churches a year. I don't even know anybody doing this. We can kind of like put it in neutral now and just cruise a little bit, can't we? And just, you know, maybe I could buy some golf clubs or a bowling ball or something, you know. And, and the Lord spoke to me that day. He says, son, he says, I finally got you to the place where you have a little bit of wisdom. I didn't like his stress on a little bit, but, uh, you know, he's God, you know. He says, you actually have some contacts now that are, you know, can really help you a lot. And he says, best of all, you know how to get a job done for me. He says, I can give you an assignment and you just get it done. He said, why would I get you to this point in life and put you on a back burner? And then he just dropped. I don't know how to explain it other than than he downloaded some new software in me and gave me a whole new vision for stuff that we were supposed to do. I said, you know how much that's going to cost? And do you know how much work that is? (laughs) He doesn't answer them kind of questions. I figured he... He knows that I'm supposed to know that answer. But I realized, and then he, through revelation, showed me uh, the principle of stewardship. You know, if if you're a good steward, you will do well in life. Basically, when we teach stewardship, we teach it on time, talents, and treasures. You properly steward your time, you're going to do well. You properly steward your talents. You can play music like these people play music. You know, you use your talents. And then your treasure, your, your wealth, your, your uh, substance. But then he showed me the graduate level or the master's level of stewardship is learning to steward your influence. Once you have been a good steward in life over the time, talent, and treasures, he's elevated you to a place of influence in your life. And then your greatest power is to steward your influence. And I was talking with your pastor some about that because God's showing him the same thing, maybe in a little bit different verbiage and all, but we got the same thing, and we realize we're now at a place where we're fathers in the Spirit. And we can do more through mentoring and just our wisdom that we have. We can accomplish more uh, than we, that we labored so hard for in our younger years. So it's powerful. And during that time, I balled it all down. I like to keep things simple. And I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I call it my three C's. First is children. 
I've seen the damage done to children. I've seen children trafficked in the sex trade. I've seen children abused. I've even seen children discarded. And I will spend all the days of my life doing everything I can to help children. That's why I go around with my little suitcase and get out my little cards and try to get people involved with kids because I realize if I can keep that kid in my home, it'll change his life forever. It'll change his generation, his family. Secondly, my second C is churches. I've found if I build a church, people keep getting saved and people get discipled. So all the days of my life, I'll dedicate myself to building as many churches as I possibly can. That's when this new opportunity came up for 20 new churches on top of the 10 or 12 we've been doing a year. I said, count me in God. I want to get involved in that because that's my second C. My third C is coffee. <laughs> and, you, and you might laugh about it, but see, I see coffee from a different perspective because of those 161 churches that we've planted, we're teaching people who had no skills and no income how to plant a seed and grow a crop that is now producing an income for them. We have over 300, probably up to, towards 400 by now, but over 300 I'm fully aware of that are now earning their living from planting coffee and providing us real good coffee. We start them up with their seedlings. We give them, uh, we help them to get established. And coffee takes four years before you start uh, earning a, 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 a crop and seven years before it comes to full maturity. But once you got them trees in the ground and take good care of them, I went down to Brazil and I went to a farm where trees were over 100 years old, still producing full crop. So I tell these farmers, I said, when you plant in that acre or them several acres of coffee, you're affecting your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. I was in this one village, I was with this little lady, again, little tribal woman, never had a day of education, can't read or write, but she took me out and showed me her 2,000 coffee plants, proud as could be. And she said, Brother Charlie, I'm so thankful you came to our village and so thankful that you introduced coffee. She says, I have five children. None of my children ever had an education. But my last child, I'm putting her through college with the money I'm making off of coffee right now. I tell you, when I see that, that that's, what, that's what the whole thing is all about. So we're affecting right from the, from the seed to the cup. And I like to provide a good uh, coffee, and, and we're looking for that thing to expand into a major business because it will someday do the fundraising for the ministry. So those are my three C's. Uh, I'm a little, uh, I guess, simple. If you're, if you're not interested in children, churches, or coffee, we probably won't spend too much time together because this is what my life is about, Okay. Uh, and so, but thank God, we're all about Jesus. Amen. There's a quote, I, the one I was trying to find. I thought it was Oswald, uh, that one fella, but uh, I, it's, Without God, we cannot. Without man, God will not. We are his eyes, his feet, his hands. We are his heart in this earth. You know, the Bible, what is it in Colossians, talks about Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I had a revelation, I had, we're out of time, and I don't have time. Of course, your pastor said, they said, they said you can have all the time you want because they're used to him. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to try to keep you nice, so 17 years from now, I'm going to come back before 17 years, anyhow. But uh, I'm kind of missing what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I lost my, my train of thought there. Well, that was dumb, Charlie. Let me close with this verse, Joel 3, 9. Prepare for war, wake up the mighty men. You know, God has mighty men and mighty women just out there sitting there. But, and when the war comes, it's time to wake them up. Amen? Very interesting. I don't have time to go into that. But if you read through that, it's talking about harvest. Talking about a few verses down, it's talking about putting in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. I believe that we're in a place in history right now where we have to wake up the mighty ones. Amen? And, uh, you know, I've, all I've done today is shown you what a bunch of nobodies have done for Jesus when they just simply woke him up. We don't have no talent. We don't have no, no reputation. We don't have anything. But we've got an army of people doing God's work there. 
And there's an army right here in this church this morning. Amen. So, who do you say Jesus is? Best of all, who does Jesus say you are? Amen. Rise up, the mighty men and women of God. And let Jesus rock your world. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. I'm going to close with this. God bless you. I've totally enjoyed myself this morning. I hope you have as well. God bless you. Well, now it's the old man's turn. Praise God. If that didn't inspire you, come on up here. We'll raise you from the dead. You know, God has been dealing with me about scriptures that have the word awake or awaken in them. And I've been seeking him over these scriptures, and he's showing me. He said, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm awakening my people to who they really are and what I want to do today. And that story, I mean... That's just what God can do when you give him your life. Because he's the only one that really knows who you are. And his destiny and his purpose uh, that he has for you. Praise God. Well, we're going to receive a love offering this morning uh, for the ministry, for Living Water Ministry, for, for Charlie and Kathy's ministry. I, uh, supporting the monthly. Charlie, the... If they want to support you monthly, do they just sign up back there? Or Okay. Yeah, if you ever need their, any other info, just ask us and we can give that to you. We as a church uh, support them monthly. But uh, if God puts it on your heart to support them monthly, and especially like it's supporting with the children and so forth, I mean, uh, this ministry is not only <laughs> preaching the gospel it's establishing the kingdom by establishing churches and even getting involved in the economy to where God's people are, uh, even in business, are, are beginning to do things that are going to cause the, uh, not just a move of God or a revival for a while, but the nation over there is being, the culture is being taken over by what God is doing through these folks. What a blessing. What an encouragement. And so... As you give this morning, I just ask you simply to look to the Lord and ask him what he wants you to put in the offering. I used to ask me what I wanted to do, and that didn't work out too good in my life. And I found out that when I ask the Lord, he may give me the answer I maybe don't want to hear at the moment, but I found that if I listen to him and do what he tells me to do, then it always comes out right. And uh, one thing I found about offerings like this is God is... Uh, He's, I, I like to say it, killing two birds with one stone. I guess maybe that's not the best way to say it. But God knows not only what they need to have come in in this offering this morning, but he knows what you need. And every time in my life I've talked to God about a need, he's talked to me about a seed. Because that's the way he works. And so this morning, just simply pray and say, Holy Spirit, I want to do what you want me to do in this offering. So I open my heart to you. And I ask you to just put it in my heart, put it in my mind. If you get two figures, the higher one's God, the lower one's you. And uh, just obey him. Amen? Praise God. So, Father, we come into agreement this morning. We thank you for the word of the Lord that was given today. God, there's a generation. As I looked around the congregation this morning and I saw the young people that were here, I saw those that are around my age here. Father, you've got a future for all of us. And I know by what you've been sharing with me, what I've been hearing come through the prophets of God in these days we live in, that we are on the cusp and on the, just the threshold of stepping into something that's going to, as he said, rock this world for you. And so as we give today, we give with that in mind. We give and we sow and we plant into this ministry that's a proven ministry an established ministry a ministry god that is literally changing a nation on the face of this earth by establishing the kingdom and i thank you for speaking to the hearts of your people i thank you that they obey you in what you uh, show them and lord i thank you that you meet their need as they plant their seed this morning into this offering and father we pray for for the ministry over there lord i i see that <laughs> That uh, second wind, if you want to call it that, that you are giving uh, Charlie and Kathy. 
And God, you're going to take them beyond what they can even ask or think. We praise you for that, Lord, and just help us to play the part we need to play in that. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is good, and his mercies are forever. Praise the Lord. So uh, when we dismiss here in, in just a moment, go back and make sure you take a look at what's on the table there and just ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Buy some coffee. Take it home. If, you don't want, if you're not a coffee drinker, take it home and bless somebody else. Take it to your neighbor and witness to him. Say, you know where this came from and how it got here? And you can share with them the gospel. You can share with them what God's doing in the nation of Thailand. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, tonight at 6, uh, Charlie was going to be ministering tonight, but they have to leave early because of a, another thing that came up they need to, to go to. And so Pastor Mike's going to be ministering tonight, but we're going to be back here at 6 o'clock tonight and have a great time. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Praise the Lord. Lord, I thank you for the purpose and the destiny of your people. I thank you for every person, Father. You have rained your, your word on us this morning. It has come from heaven to help us. And I thank you, Father, that no longer do we see ourselves based on the devil's opinion or our opinion or somebody else's opinion, but we see ourselves on, based on your opinion. And as people seek you this week, as they spend time with you, I pray that you'll paint the vision of God in their heart and show them the destiny that you have for them. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. We'll be back tonight at 6.